Okay, welcome to chapters 13 and 14, uh, Evolutionary Theory. So this is my favorite subject right here, aside from ecology. Um, I am also needing to eat, so of course you are getting me in the kitchen. So I will be making pauses here and there to make dinner. You won't be tested over the recipes. Uh, right now I am making my Indian clarified butter, ghee. Uh, it's a really easy recipe, so... Shouldn't be too much hard, or shouldn't be too difficult to lecture and keep an eye on my butter. So, when we talk about evolution, the first person we have to talk about is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is the first guy to publish a concise scientific explanation for the origin of species and uh, evolutionary theory. Now, this isn't to say Charles Darwin is the only man who thought of evolution. In fact, I believe it was either his grandfather or granduncle uh, who actually came upon the idea first, uh, but didn't put it out in scientific terms. There was also another scientist who came up with evolution as well um, at the same time as Darwin. Darwin just got the recognition for it. Not to cheapen any of the things he accomplished, because, quite frankly, it's an epic feat to have come to all of this information. So, Charles Darwin sailed around the world on the HMS Beagle. And he was most impressed with South America and a little place in the uh, Caribbean called the Galapagos Islands. He was the ship's naturalist. So, in the age of Darwin, in the 1800s, 18, uh, you know, the 1820s, 30s, 40s, um, Ships employed a naturalist to be on hand to characterize the living world of the places they explore, which is pretty cool. Uh, as the naturalist, he took tons and tons and tons of notes on everything, and he made tons of observations, painstakingly written out, so that other scientists could see what he saw. And during the course of taking all these notes and observations, he developed a big idea. And that idea is evolution. His observations were different species occupying similar habitats and food sources had similar characteristics. So, animals that ate the same type of food in the same type of habitat tended to have similar adaptations, which was pretty interesting. Uh, because, really, why should they have similar characteristics if they're different species? Why would you see any shared characteristics at all if they were all created individually on their own? And these observations started to really, truly coalesce when Darwin came to the Galapagos Islands and observed the Galapagos finches because there are 14 different finch species on the Galapagos Islands. And these finches all occupy different niches. A niche is sort of an ecological role. Uh, so where you live and what you eat is sort of your niche. The more specialized your niche, the more specific the thing you eat is. So if there's an animal that only eats one certain species, then that has a very specific niche. Anyway, all these Galapagos finches had their own little niches, um, but they lived in similar habitats. So, Darwin was able to observe what happens when you have birds that are very, very similar and live in similar habitats, but eat different foods. And what happens is that these birds display differently shaped beaks. Uh, so, Darwin came to the reasonable conclusion that at some point, one or more populations of mainland finches must have made their way to the Galapagos, and then all 14 species of finch there in the Galapagos are descended from that original population. So, how did they come to produce 14 different species that exploit different food sources? Well, 
Darwin came up with a theory of natural selection to explain how traits arise in different habitats. The important concepts in natural selection include reproductive success. This is a big one. Darwin didn't talk a lot about reproductive success, but with modern science we know this is a huge factor in natural selection. Adaptation is also important in natural selection. Um, and of course when we talk about natural selection I'll be defining it specifically and then we'll need to talk about natural selection and evolution with regards to gene frequency. So let's define these concepts here in order to coalesce our idea of natural selection. Reproductive success, I abbreviated as RS all throughout here. Uh, reproductive success is the success an individual species has in passing on its genes. Uh, an offspring's success in passing on its genes is also factored into an individual's reproductive success. In fact, the reproductive success of my grandparents is measured not only by their kids having kids, but uh, if I were to have kids, that would uh, go towards my grandparents' reproductive success. In other words, uh, the lineage, the success of the overall lineage in passing on genes. So. The main goal of an organism is to breed. And when you breed, you pass on your genes. And so the reproductive success of an organism is measured by how well its genes are passed from one generation to the next. Because every time it breeds, it passes on its genes. And then when its offspring breeds, those genes get passed on again and again and again and again with each breeding event. So the more reproductive success, the more your genes are passed on. High reproductive success is awesomeness. That is success for a species. The greater your reproductive success, the more often your genes are passed on, and the more lineages through which you find your genes. Uh, so your genes continue in the population long past the death of the individual. Uh, so this is important for the concept of natural selection because the individual itself isn't necessarily required to survive as long as it possibly can. It needs to survive and breed as much as it possibly can. High reproductive success can be more important than survival. Uh, there are species of spiders where the male mates with the female, and then the female devours the male. However, in mating with her, he secures the continuation of his genes. So in that case, reproductive success outweighs survival. Adaptation is also very important in reproductive success. Adaptation is becoming specialized to a local environment. Uh, so, whether or not that's specialized to the food you have available to you, specialized to uh, compete with other animals, specialized to the vegetation in which you live, uh, you become specialized to your local environment. And the apparent and adaptation is when the uh, appearance and inheritance of traits that increase survivability and reproductive success occurs. So, when an organism is adapting to its environment, it is developing traits that increase its survivability in its environment and its reproductive success in its environment. A gene that increases survival or reproductive success will become more common in a population over time. I need to uh, keep an eye on my butter here because I want to uh, make sure I pull it off the heat as soon as the milk fats fall out of solution to the bottom there. So here's a bald eagle with a variety of adaptations specialized for its life. It has a big stretchy throat so uh, it can eat large chunks of fish 
So that's an adaptation to eating fish. Uh, the beak here, uh, we have a strong tip that's sharp for piercing and re uh, ripping apart the toughest fish. You have a big strong tongue for pushing big chunks of th fish into the stretchy throat. Uh, and so this bird is very well adapted to its life as a bird of prey that feeds primarily on fish. Uh, while we're talking about adaptation, I want to talk about the Russian Desmond. The Russian Desmond is an awesome example of the kind of adaptation you get when an animal is in its local environment and the population has time to become more adapted to that environment. So let's look at this little bugger. What does this look like to you? Rodent, you say? Mink? Mink? Hmm, I don't know. Here's another picture of it. Pretty weird. We see those big giant front teeth. Definitely a rodent of some kind. But what what kind of rodent? It's not a beaver. Maybe it's related to beavers. But what do you think the Russian Desmond evolved? Well, here's another picture of a Russian Desmond. See this long little narrow snout here? It's pretty interesting. Look at those tiny, tiny beady eyes. Almost useless. Sort of fuzzy, and then what, what are these giant clawed hands? Huh. Well, let's think about this. What does this animal look like? This Russian Desma that obviously lives in an aquatic environment. With its webbed feet and its bare, flattened tail for swimming around. What does it look like to you? What family of animals could this organism possibly belong? Well, it's a rodent. It's aquatic. It's got a long, sensitive nose, big whiskers, and almost useless eyes, and then big old claws on its feet. Hmm. Let's take a look at this. The broad-footed mole. In fact, the Russian Desmond is an aquatic mole. That's right. The organism you've only ever heard of as an, a little burrowing animal that digs around under the ground and ruins gardens. Well, in Russia, there is a mole that lives in the water. Here is the Russian Desmond, and here is another mole. And you can see strong similarities in their body's shape. So, this is a mole that over time became adapted to an aquatic lifestyle. That is pretty epic. It still retains some of the features that uh, were part of its burrowing heritage. For instance, its tiny beady eyes that are practically useless. It doesn't see very well. In fact, a Russian Desmond uh, uses this incredibly sensitive nose and whiskers to find prey in the water, little um, clams and mollusks. Russian Desmond is pretty epic. So what causes adaptation? What can cause you to go from being a subterranean uh, digging mole to an aquatic organism with a tail that's been flattened to help propel it through water? Well, natural selection causes adaptation. Natural selection produces adaptation. What is natural selection? Well, when we talk about natural selection, we have to focus on the word natural, meaning the natural environment. The natural environment consists of both living and physical parts. What are some examples of living and physical parts of your natural environment? That's right! The weather is an example of your natural environment. Uh, the climate, how cold or warm it is, how 
moist it is, how much rain you get. Those are all examples. Living parts of your natural environment are the other animals around you, the other plants around you, the things with which you interact. And these natu the natural environment produces pressures on an organism. In other words, a pressure is how the environment influences organisms living in it. Think of a pressure as something that affects how well an organism is able to survive. Winter, cold climate, that's an evolutionary pressure. That's a selective pressure. Predation, that's a selective pressure. Drought, selective pressure. The, ability, the availability of your water is going to influence how well you survive. Blizzards, how often they occur, selective pressures, pressures on how well you survive. Anything that affects an organism's survival and is part of its natural environment is a selective pressure. What else can you think of? Yeah? Uh-huh? No, actually, not robots. Robots are not part of the natural environment. Thank you, though. That was nice. Let's try over here. Mm hmm Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That's that's a good one. Yes. Um, you know, the, uh, the availability of sunlight. That's a good example of a selective pressure. So, all these things uh, affect an organism's ability to survive. So, natural selection is when the natural environment has an effect on an organism's ability to survive and pass on genes. Traits that aid in survival and reproductive success are end up getting passed on. Helpful traits may allow more breeding, right? If you can survive a little better, then you have a little bit more energy left over for breeding. Remember way back at the beginning of the semester when we talked about an organism's energy all being contained in a single cup, right? They have a single cup with their energy in it. And just being able to live in their environment costs some energy. Hunting food costs some energy. Avoiding predators costs energy. All the things an organism does costs energy. And then... Breeding also costs energy. The less energy it costs to simply survive in your environment, if we have this much energy it costs to survive in the environment, and we reduce it to this, then we can add that energy saved to energy available for breeding. So, a helpful trait can allow more breeding. It, may, it can allow an individual to pass on their genes to more offspring and pass on their genes more often. Thus, helpful traits tend to become more common in the population. With enough time, every individual in the population may end up with those helpful traits. Individuals without the helpful traits didn't die, necessarily. They were outbred. Now, it could also be that individuals without the helpful traits bred with individuals that had the helpful traits, and their offspring had the helpful traits. So it's not like just lack of a helpful trait will make you die out. It's not going to kill you if you don't have a helpful trait. It's just you will be outbred by someone who does have a helpful trait. So we can look at natural selection in, say, a population of elephants. Some have more fat than others, right? What does fat store? Energy, that's right. Fat stores energy. Your body can take fat and metabolize it to produce ATP. So, uh, some elephants have more fat than others. They have more ATP stored up. Some elephants, completely average. 
Some have bigger ears. All right? Well, let's put our elephants in a drought. Water becomes scarce. Without water, the elephants have a hard time building up their energy reserves. So which elephants are going to do well during this drought? Food is becoming scarce. What's that? That's right, the fat elephants. The fat elephants have extra energy storage, so they're going to be able to breathe. And so maybe they have some genes that make them more husky than other elephants. Well, if food becomes rare in their environment, the elephants that have more fat are going to survive and reproduce more than the elephants that have less because they'll be spending extra energy to survive, to find out, find extra food. How about a major heat wave? Well, what can help with not uh, managing heat? Hmm. Uh, what can I? What What are you saying? What's that? What? Oh, oh yes, your ears. That's right. There's a lot of blood capillaries running through your ears. In fact, African elephants who are exposed to large amounts of sunlight and air have very large ears. And the blood running through their ears allows them to radiate heat away from their body out through their ears. Their ears can sort of cool them off by being a place where heat escapes the body. So our elephants with bigger ears are going to manage the heat a little bit better than the elephants with smaller ears. And so they will be spending less energy managing their body temperature. Elephants with smaller ears are going to have to do things like seek out shade or water or something to try and get out of the heat. Whereas the elephants with bigger ears won't have to do that as much, so they'll be saving energy, which they can put towards breeding. Will the average elephants die out completely in a drought? Probably not. Will the big-eared elephants die out in a drought? Probably not. The fat elephants, uh, they probably won't die out in a drought. Average elephants aren't going to dry out or die out in a heat wave. The average elephants won't die out in the heat wave. No, these guys aren't dying out. Just because you're not as well adapted doesn't mean you're not going to survive. Just because an animal is better able to survive doesn't mean others die out. Uh, it just means the animal that is not as able to survive doesn't breed as much may in fact not amount to a gigantic difference in reproductive success. That advantage in breeding may only be a tiny one, and so you may only get a little bump in reproductive success. So your average elephants and your fat elephants are going to stick around in a heat wave. They're still going to breed, just not as well as the big-eared elephants. And due to the environment's constant changing patterns, uh, it's unlikely that the drought will persist long enough that every single elephant becomes, you know, gets the big-eared gene. That would have to be an extremely persistent environmental condition to be, uh, to be to the point that every member of the species ends up with that gene. Um, however, they may mate with the ones that have the nice trait, and their offspring may show the new trait. So they're around, their offspring may show up with the new trait doesn't mean they died out or that they weren't fit to survive. Remember, evolution is survival of the good enough. If you're good enough to survive and reproduce, you're doing fine. It's not survival of the fittest. Fittest implies only the best survive. No. Evolution is survival, natural selection and evolution, that is survival of the good enough. Where if you're good enough, you survive. So nature selects for populations better adapted to their natural environment. It is not a directed selection and it is not a conscious selection. There is not a goal. Natural selection is sort of a tinkerer. It does not have a 
plan. If an individual has genes that are helpful, it will pass those genes on. And you'll see those in the population. It is purely by survival and breeding. So just luck of being able to survive and breed. All right, gene frequency. This one is really easy. Uh, gene frequency is literally how often you see specific genes in a population. Now, population, seen how is italics, is in, seen how the word is in italics, we can see that that is an important word there. How often you see specific genes in a population. This is because evolution does not occur at the individual level. I do not evolve. The population evolves. Because evolution in a population is changes in gene frequencies. How often you see a gene. So, when a gene in a population changes, when you see more individuals with the gene than in the previous generation, that's evolution. You see fewer individuals with that gene than in the previous generation, that's evolution. What can genes influence? They can influence an organism's physical traits. They can influence their behavioral traits. So genes can influence a lot. So evolution can occur just on physical adaptations, and you can see behavioral adaptations. I'm waiting for my butter. It's been boiling for a while now, and I'm... Uh, waiting for the stuff, all the animal fat rose to the surface, and then it's boiling away, and I'm waiting for it to fall to the bottom there. And once it falls to the bottom and just slightly browns, my ghee will be finished, and I'm going to have to immediately change it over to a container to hold it so it stops cooking. All right, so let's look at physical and behavioral traits. Traits can affect survivability and reproductive success in several ways. They can have a positive effect on survivability and reproductive success. A gene can give you a bonus. Oh, I think it's done. A gene can also negatively impact you, meaning it reduces an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. And a gene can also have no effect on an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. Positive traits, traits that Increased survivability and or reproductive success become more frequent in a population. Makes sense, right? If you can breed a little bit more frequently because you have a gene that helps you out with that, then you're probably going to see that gene become more common in the population simply because individuals with it are able to breed and pass it on. A negative trait. Well, if a positive trait becomes more common in the population, a trait that decreases survivability or reproductive success is going to become less common in the population. Which brings us to the third and final one, neutral. And there are a lot of traits that are neutral. Traits that have no effects on survivability or reproductive success are completely unaffected by natural selection. All right? For instance, hair color, eye color. We see a lot of diversity in these traits.
because they have pretty close to no effect on survivability or reproductive success. I've never lost a chance to survive because I have hazel eyes. Uh, so, um, the natural environment, you know, does not have any kind, the, the, my hair color or my eye color has no e effect on my ability to survive the natural environment. Negative traits, you know, a trait that sort of, uh, a, a trait that makes me, I don't know, a less able of a hunter, makes it so that I have to work harder for my food. And if I have to work harder for my food, it may be less likely that I'll survive. And also, since I'm devoting more energy to hunting, I'm not able to breed as much. So negative traits become less common. You don't see those traits as often. And then positive traits, they help you out. You see them more often because you just breed better with some positive traits. So neutral traits vary randomly in a population. Uh, and discussing all of this will finally bring us to a discussion of evolution. So. Evolution is survival of the... That's right. You heard me last time. Good enough. New traits don't magically appear. So if you're good enough to survive, you will survive. Uh, evolution, um, you know, uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that um, an organism's potential is limited by all the genes they have on hand, right? A mutation isn't going to cause gigantic, amazing changes. For instance, you know, we would have survived on the savannah much better with an extra set of arms, right? Set of arms for hucking a spear and a set of arms for carrying stuff. That would have been awesome. Uh, could have thrown like four spears at once or fired two bows and arrows, right? That'd be pretty sweet. Uh, centaur legs, also useful on the savanna. Our pudgy little ape legs weren't very fast compared to all the other animals around us. We could outrun, like, you know, birds as long as they didn't fly and weren't ostriches. So, centaur legs would have been way better. Horse legs? Heck yeah! But that would have made us much faster. We could be like, Throwing four spears and running around with horse legs would have been very cool. But, alas, uh, you know, extra arms with axe blades. Ooh. Yeah, okay, okay, I'm getting ridiculous. Allow me to move past this. Anyway, natural selection only acts on the genes that are present. Natural selection does not make new genes. A population has limited genetic variation. Add up all the genes for all the different traits in a population, and that's what evolution has to act on, except for the occasional mutation. Uh, I remember when we talked about, uh, or actually I, I don't remember if we mentioned mutation, but mutation is basically a change in base pairs. Uh, so where you change like an A to a T. And so mutations generally don't cause huge things. Now, they can, granted. Uh, it would be very rare. And the grand majority of mutations are either negative or neutral. It's very rare that a positive mutation adds a new variation to a population. However, time cures all things. So, wah! Oh, that's pleasant. Uh, so, given enough time, you will see positive mutations. Crack. Oh, my filter. Blue. Now there's particulates in my butter. I'm going to have to refilter that. Uh, so, given enough time, you will see positive mutations making changes. But, at its very basic, evolution can only act on all the genes 
for all the different traits in the population on hand. No genes for centaur legs means no centaur legs. No genes for spare arms means no spare arms. Uh, you know, this has gone on for a long time, and I need to do some cleanup now and refilter my ghee. So we'll uh, stop here and continue with common ancestry in the next